All right, let's get started. I want to welcome everyone to this afternoon's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we'll be focusing on a just published book by Yale historian Joanne Meyerowitz, A War on Global Poverty, The Lost Promise of Redistribution, and the Rise of Microcredit, published by Princeton University Press. Joining us for the discussion today are Amy Offner, Sonia Michelle, and Natasha Stavanovich fenn I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University. I co-chair the Washington History Seminar along with my colleague, Christian Osterman of the Wilson Center. The seminar is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly in pre-COVID times in person at the Wilson Center and since pandemic restrictions here in the virtual realm. We have a continuing lineup of sessions still ahead of us this season that'll carry us into uh, July. Uh, we have one this coming Monday, May 24th at 4 p.m. when we discuss Louis Manan's recently published book, The Free World, Art and Thought in the Cold War. Please join us for that session as well as today's. Behind the scenes, there are two people whose labors make these seminars possible. Pete Bierstecker of the Woodrow Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And we'd like to thank the financial supporters of the seminar, both anonymous and not anonymous. And as always, we invite you to join their ranks. On the logistics front, you should know today's session is being recorded and can be soon found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function uh, on Zoom uh, or the Q&A function, if you will. Those watching on Facebook Live, you can email questions to Rachel Wheatley, whose email address is posted in the chat function. It's now my pleasure to introduce Joanne Meyerowitz, uh, who is the Arthur Yubovsky Professor of History and American Studies at Yale University. She earned her BA from the University of Chicago, her PhD from Stanford. Her publications include How Sex Changed, A History of Transsexuality in the United States, published in 2002, the edited volume History in September 11th in 2003, and more recently, 180 op-eds or how to make the present historical in the Journal of American History. She's a former editor of the Journal of American History and a past president of the Organization of American Historians. I'll be discussing our, or introducing our discussants individually before they begin their comments. And with that, Joanne, the Zoom screen is all yours. Well, thank you, Eric, for that introduction. And thank you to Rachel Wheatley and Peter Bierstecker and Christian Osterman for all the work that goes into these seminars. And thank you to my commentators and thanks to all of you who are here today. So my book, A War on Global Poverty, is a history of US involvement in global anti-poverty campaigns in the 1970s and 1980s. It runs roughly from modernization to microcredit and it explains how and why anti-poverty programs increasingly focused on women. I started the project through curiosity about something called the Percy, Percy Amendment, which is a somewhat obscure amendment passed in 1973 to the US Foreign Assistance Act that mandated that US foreign assistance agencies include women in their economic projects overseas. So I started with the Percy Amendment, but as many of you know, books take on a life of their own. And as I did my research, I discovered things I didn't originally know, which is of course what should happen when you do research. And I ended up with a somewhat different book that has three separate but overlapping interlocking histories. The book's first part, the first of the three interlocking histories, recounts how development experts, economists, policymakers, activists, and others redefined their field in the 1970s as a war on global poverty. In the 1970s, they rejected the trickle-down economics that had dominated their field, the assumption that if you build infrastructure, if you build bridges, airports, dams, ports, factories, and so on, then national wealth would increase and then trickle down to the poor. As they reputedly, repeatedly repudiated trickle-down theories, they began to focus less on national economic growth as the measure of success. They turned to questions, and they turned to questions of redistribution, how to redistribute wealth both between nations and within them. And they turned into directly addressing the basic needs of the world's poor. 
So you can see this rising interest in global poverty, just to give two quick examples. In the popular book, The Challenge of World Poverty, published in 1970 by the well-known Swedish economist Gunnar Myrdal, and the book The Poverty Curtain, published in 1976 by the Pakistani economist Mahbub ul Haq. Both of them, Myrdal and Haq, were influential figures. For a variety of reasons, these 1970s development experts were nudged to the left, at least for a decade. They were moved by the failures of previous foreign aid and development programs, and also by the radical social movements of the 1960s, by social democrats in Europe, by African socialists, and by religious idealists, all of whom were addressing poverty and pointing to global inequality. And so development experts in the US and elsewhere turn their attention to the people often referred to in the 1970s as the poorest of the poor. And their concerns with global poverty found its way in various forms into the UN, the World Bank, the Ford Foundation, USAID, that is the United States Agency for International Development and various other agencies, NGOs and institutions around the globe. The second part of my book shows how this growing anti-poverty movement came to focus on women, partly because of the interest in on the ground poverty where women were clearly among the poorest of the poor, partly because of the rise of global feminism, and partly because of growing concern with the urban informal economy where women often predominated. In any case, over the course of the 1970s and 1980s, poor women in the global South were increasingly included in development projects. Initially, the concern was mostly access. Why were women left out of anti-poverty projects? Why were men the ones trained in new techniques and hired for new jobs and promoted as community leaders? Or why, when women were included, were they considered mainly as mothers, as child rearers who needed to learn about nutrition and health and child development, or as child bearers who needed to have fewer children? In the 1970s, a new international women in development movement argued that women should be seen as income generators. That term income generators was the lingo of the time and often repeat, repeated. And that, they, and that women should be included in all economic development programs. The core premise of the women in development movement was that women should be integrated through income generating productivity into the modern economy. From the start, the Women in Development movement was international, and its biggest publicity boost came from a book by the Danish economist Esther Basrup, uh, titled Woman's Role in Economic Development and published in 1970. Basrup made the case that development programs were actually harming women, undermining their traditional status and roles by excluding them from the training technology and jobs offered to men. She already had clout. She was a prominent economist who had worked extensively with the United Nations. And her book became the Bible, the often cited foundational source for the women in development movement. In the US, Basrup's arguments inspired a group of liberal feminists within the US government to push successfully for the Percy Amendment to the Foreign Assistance Act. And her arguments had a role on a bigger stage in 1975 at the United Nations International Women's Year Conference held in Mexico City with thousands in attendance from around the world. The conference promoted women in economic development as one of its three key themes. The other two themes were peace and equality and the development theme drew directly from Basrup's book. The advocates of women in development were mostly women themselves and some of them gradually worked their way into the halls of power. By the end of the 1970s, the UN, the World Bank, USAID, the Peace Corps, and many others had all started women in development programs and offices. The movement was just taking off when Ronald Reagan won the presidency in the US in 1980. In the US government, the women in development staff and its supporters worried that Reagan would cut off their funding. But as it turned out, the Reagan administration did not oppose putting poor women to work in income generating activities. It did though favor some approaches more than others. The center of activity shifted to initiatives that focused more on individualized petty capitalist solutions. When Reagan came into office, the emphasis went to privately owned business enterprise. 
USAID and various government funded NGOs soon accommodated to the new political winds. They changed the orientation of women in development within the US government, but they didn't eliminate it. In academia, uh, the women in development movement was often associated with socialist feminist and Marxist feminist scholars from all over the world. But in the US government in the 1980s, it increasingly turned to a petty capitalist model. The third part of my book is how this combined interest in poverty and women came together in the 1980s in the new development trend of microcredit, which provides tiny loans to poor people, mostly to women, intended to make them entrepreneurs. In the more conservative 1980s, this represented a retreat from redistribution, a retreat from statist or, or government funded programs, and a turn to private market oriented business development but it sustained the interest in poverty and in women. In economic development circles, credit was not a new issue in the 1980s. Development projects often extended credit uh, to farmers, for example, who needed loans to buy seeds and fertilizer and then repaid the loans after the harvest. Most such loans went to men. And from the mid 1970s on, the women in development movement called for giving women equal access to credit. Men got credit, women should too. And if you've ever owned a credit card, you know that credit can be useful. But by the end of the 1970s, the stories had moved beyond the call for access. Impoverished women were now cast as especially in need of credit. It was argued, for example, that women were the poorest of the poor and therefore any poverty program should focus on them, especially on the increasing number of women in households without adult men. If poor men needed loans, then poor women needed them more. And then by the 1980s, there was an additional frequently told story that women were not only the poorest and deserving of access to credit, but also better investments than men. In the emerging microcredit literature, women were seen as less likely than men to waste their loans on alcohol, gambling, sex, and tobacco, and more likely to spend their income on their children and more likely to repay their debts. I found this argument occasionally in the late 1970s and repeatedly in the 1980s. What we're seeing here is a significant shift in the stories told about gender. In earlier development literature, men were seen as the breadwinners, as the workers who needed jobs and training in order to lift their families and villages out of poverty. Now in the microcredit moment, Women were seen as key players in the economy, as the entrepreneurs whose road to prosperity came not from jobs, but from loans, from borrowing, investing in a small business, and of course, repaying their debts. With microcredit, women of the global South were now the virtuous poor, deserving of economic assistance, and men were increasingly vilified and often just written off as slackers, gamblers, drunkards, whores, and deserters who couldn't be trusted to repay their debts or take care of their children. Microcredit emerged in the late 1970s in multiple programs in Latin America and South Asia, but by the mid 1980s, the most famous microcredit program by far was the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, which was in the language of the day, a minimalist program, meaning that it focused in its early years solely on providing loans. Muhammad Yunus founded the Grameen Bank in 1977. He scaled it up rapidly and eventually won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 for his work. He was an astute ambassador who promoted his program brilliantly around the globe. In the US, Yunus appealed especially to liberals and at their invitation, he testified before and met with members of Congress where he shared success stories of hardworking women lifting themselves out of poverty by borrowing from the Grameen Bank instead of from local loan sharks. In 1987, when Congress mandated that the US spend millions in foreign aid funds for microcredit overseas, the supporters were mostly left-leaning liberals, including Ted Kennedy, Barbara Boxer, and Ron Dellums, but also died in the wool conservatives including John McCain, Orrin Hatch, and Mike DeWine. This was part of Eunice's charismatic draw that he appealed to conservatives as well as liberals. As one foreign service officer remembered it later, even Newt Gingrich loved this guy. <laughs> 
So the microcredit programs matched up well with the growing interest in poverty, in small scale projects, and in women, and they fit the market oriented anti statist neoliberalism of the 1980s. In the conservative climate of the 1980s, microcredit was billed as business, not a government handout, and loans were seen as better than grants, which were considered negatively as welfare programs. In this line of thinking, loans, which had to be repaid, made poor people responsible, made them better economic actors than did grants, which allegedly made them dependent. Microcredit was also cheap, a form of aid that could replenish itself through repayment with interest, and it sustained a faith in capitalist investment. As the microcredit movement took off in the 1990s, it became for a time the latest development fad. In 1997, the first World Microcredit Summit was held in Washington, DC, with First Lady Hillary Clinton as co-chair. Bill and Hillary Clinton, by the way, were big advocates of microcredit. At the summit, more than 2,900 delegates from 139 nations attended and Eunice and many others spoke. The summit's plan of action opened with a statement that it was launching, quote, a global movement to reach 100 million of the world's poorest families, especially the women of those families with credit for self-employment. And there have been several more such summits since then. But almost as soon as microcredit became a big development trend, the critics started expressing their skepticism. It's worth noting that microcredit rose at the very same time that a debt crisis pushed multiple nations in the global south to the brink of bankruptcy. Was credit, which is debt by another name, really a good thing? We have dozens of studies now, and the debates about microcredit continue to rage. Does microcredit give poor women the same assistance in expanding an enterprise that wealthier people routinely enjoy? Does it help women develop businesses? Does it, in the more recent vocabulary, empower women? Or does microcredit push women into unsustainable tiny businesses that routinely fail? Does it send the poor spiraling into debt, replacing government services and government funding with minuscule private loans? Does it depend on a gender hierarchy in which women are responsible for both unpaid child rearing and businesses that don't bring in enough money to live to family out of poverty? In between these two sides, microcredit's good, microcredit's bad, economists who measure impact say that in the best such programs, microcredit can offer some benefits to those who can use small loans, but they also say that it will not and cannot actually end poverty. And it's hardly surprising that going into debt is not the best route to prosperity. But microfinance in its various forms is still a multi-billion dollar business today and it still emphasizes loans to women. So let me end with two concluding points. First, I'm a US historian and I started off imagining that I'd write a history of how the US exported its own ideas about development to the global South. But the more I researched, the more it became clear that the US was not at the forefront of new ideas in economic development in this era. And in the archives, I encountered a number of people from outside the US who had outsized influence uh, within the US. I came to think of them using a current term as influencers, not like today's internet influencers who sell products, but the type of influencers who, sells, who sell ideas and policies. They were ambassadors of sorts who knew how to sell their programs in the US. I've already mentioned Mahbub al-Haq, Esther Basarup, and Muhammad Yunus, but there were others as well. So one theme in my book is how people from outside the US shape the ideas, policies, and programs within it. Second, I wanna note that it's easy to criticize economic development programs. They often fail. They've often involved ethnocentric condescension, national self-interest, geopolitical rivalry, military interventions, neo-colonialism, and bureaucratic bungling. And many, maybe even most of the histories of development are highly critical of it and often for good reason. My book too is in part a cautionary tale, but I'm not a nihilist. And I want us to remember that we, and by we, I mean an expansive we across the globe, we should work to redistribute wealth. 
we should work for gender equality and we should work to end poverty and its material deprivations. And I was taken with some of the unfulfilled aspirations of the 1970s. Leaders of the Global South proposed in the United Nations in a, a resolution, the New International Economic Order, that would reset the rules of international trade so that they didn't give the automatic advantage to wealthier nations. And various economists and activists proposed plans to end poverty by the year 2000. And by the end of the 1970s, some of them had proposed an international tax on say arms sales or transnational corporations or minerals extracted from the ocean floor. And these taxes would be used for global anti-poverty programs. Those are the kinds of proposals I want us to remember as we imagine for our own day, what it would take to have both gender equality and a just redistribution of wealth. Thank you. Amy Offner is Associate Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. She received her PhD from Columbia and her research has been supported by institutions including the ACLS, the NEH, the Charles Warren Center at Harvard University, the Tamament Library at NYU, amongst other institutions. She is the author of Sorting Out the Mixed Economy, the Rise and Fall of Welfare and Development States in the Americas, published by Princeton in 2019, which she presented to this very seminar at the Wilson Center just about a month and a half before in-person events were ended because of the pandemic. It is great to have you back, Amy. The screen is yours. Great, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm really honored to be part of um, this discussion of Joanne Meyerowitz's book, which um, I so enjoyed reading. This is the first book to show how the practice of extending small loans to women in the global South became orthodoxy among US development experts and US development institutions. And in the process, it shows us a number of other things. It shows how feminist, left-wing and liberal critiques of development during the 1970s became transmuted and turned into neoliberal prescriptions. It also shows us how women replaced men as the sort of idealized objects of US aid. So the first thing I wanna say is that I think that this book is really pathbreaking among studies of US development policy for analyzing women and gender at all. And I say that as someone working in the field and it says nothing good about the field. Um, I would say that this is a field that did not deserve to have Joanne Meyerowitz sort of walk into the room and show us what we had been ignoring. The historiography of US empire, of course, includes very important work on gender and sexuality, but the narrower literature on development prescriptions coming from the United States in the years after 1945 is really largely devoid of gender analysis and even of women. Um, so this book brings new questions to the field and it brings a new cast of female characters to the study of US development debates and US uh, policymaking. I'll say myself that as I read the book, it became clear to me how many people I myself had overlooked in the archives. So for instance, this book introduced me to a figure like Barbara Ward, someone whose name I knew because I had actually come across her many times in archival research. Um, and I had thought you know, that it would be interesting to know more about her and then I had done absolutely nothing to actually find out anything about her. And um, there are other people in the story who um, I hadn't even perceived in the archive and, and perhaps should have. So in all of my reading about Montague Udelman of the Rockefeller Foundation, who I had, you know, just read so much by him, I never had any inkling that his wife, Sally Udelman, had her own equally significant career in international development. So I think that for anyone who's written on U.S. development policy after 1945, there will just be moments in reading this book when you just want to kind of bang your head on the table. <laughs> or to put it another way, the book makes a big contribution. In some ways, um, the book is really an ode to the 1970s, and I think it's part of a wave of scholarship that's really reframing the 1970s, not just as a moment of crisis or a moment of retrenchment, but as a time when left-wing programs for political economic and social transformation were really on the table. So in international development debates, this was a time when modernization prescriptions that had guided US development policy since the 1940s came to crisis. And the book follows a polyglot 
group of critics who stepped into the breach. They included feminists, they included um, leftists, critiques of capitalism, they included liberals who simply wanted to tinker around the edges maybe, but uh, even that tinkering could, could have some significant implications. Um, many, but not all of these figures were foreigners. And indeed, one of the important arguments of the book is that US policymaking and intellectual life were really profoundly shaped by foreign critics. All of these groups rejected the idea that economic growth would redound to the benefit of everyone, um, an idea that had you know, for so long informed US development uh, prescriptions all over the world. And they tried to reorient policy toward the problem of poverty within nations. She shows that you know, some of these critics um, also hope to change the rules of international trade, taxation, and investment in order to redistribute wealth from the global north to the global south. And the book focuses especially on the mobilization for the new international economic order within the UN. So as the book shows, the NIEO's goals um, uh, were at one moment kind of entirely reconcilable with the goal of also addressing the needs of poor people within countries, but that those two goals became disentangled from one another over the course of the 1970s. By the end of the decade, proposals to transform the international economic system were really off the table. And what was left behind was a somewhat um, diminished version of the idea that development aid should provide for the basic needs of the poor. And that notion could lean left, but it could also lean right. Simultaneously, the book shows how the 1970s produced a new feminist mobilization that pressed development agencies to recognize women's poverty and to redress it by expanding women's opportunities to earn income. And this part of the book, I think, is particularly interesting for a very sympathetic, but also very sharp analysis of political differences among feminists and the political compromises that many of them had to make in order to be heard inside foundations, government offices and multilateral agencies. One of the strengths of the book is the way that it shows the circulation of ideas between groups that had very little in common and the way that the proposals of, and ideas of the 1970s changed as they were picked up and adapted over time. So having explored the feminist mobilizations of the 1970s, the book then takes us inside the world of NGOs that were expanding um, as vehicles for anti-poverty policy in the 1980s. And in this world, there was a growing fascination with self-employment in the informal economy. And that interest in, in informality led NGOs to take note of poor women who feminists were also high highlighting. So the book argues that the turn toward addressing women's poverty went hand in hand with delegation of development assistance to private nonprofit organizations. Those organizations, partly of their own volition and partly in response to the um, need to survive under the Reagan administration, insistently analyzed women as entrepreneurial income generators. And by the end of the book, we see how that um, uh, becomes transformed. We see the emergence of microcredit as a full-fledged neoliberal instrument in the wake of the debt crisis and the rise of structural adjustment. Um, this is in many ways then a declension narrative. It's a story about how calls in the 1970s for massive transfers of wealth from the global north to the global south became transformed into the idea that in the words of one recent brochure that's quoted uh, in the book, you can help fight global poverty one tiny loan at a time. And I think it's, it's an important argument about the potential radicalism of the 1970s and the ways that dissent was channeled and diffused across the 1980s and 1990s, which are, of course, decades that historians are really only beginning to analyze and understand. But what the epilogue to the book makes clear is that the book isn't just written to be a tragedy. It's also an attempt to recover and remember the possibilities of the 1970s. The dream of redistributing wealth from north to south, the dream of eradicating poverty within nations, and the dream of eliminating women's impoverishment and subordination, those are dreams that are worth pursuing. And the book argues that history provides us actually with some intellectual resources that we might take up again. This book is, um, in addition to just the, the um, contribution of the argument itself, it's beautifully written. Um, I think that will surprise no one. It's the kind of book that I think will be assigned to undergraduates. And it's the kind of book that should find, I think, a lot of interested readers well beyond the academy. Um, 
I thought I might throw out a few questions, which um, you may or may not want to address. One of the really interesting insights of this book is that in the 1970s and 1980s, there comes to be a, a contradiction in U.S. understandings of poor women. So in foreign aid programs, poor women were becoming constructed as the deserving poor, while at home, of course, they were subject to uh, racist vilification as welfare queens. And the book shows that these two images, in some ways you can see them as having been produced by different groups of people. So liberals and leftists who dissented from the punishing image of the welfare uh, queen helped to sustain an alternative way of seeing poor women. And I wondered, um, if I guess I would just be interested to hear you say more about how this contradiction was sustained within U.S. society and particularly how it might have been sustained within the minds of Americans who might not have held to one idea or the other, but might have actually held both at the same time. We see, for instance, in the book, these really fascinating glimpses of popular investment in international anti-poverty work. So there's walkathons, there's celebrity fundraising and so on. So in the minds of Americans, people may well have held both of these ideas at once, one way of seeing poor women abroad and one way of seeing poor women at home. And if that's the case, um, I wonder what you think might've been the conditions of possibility that could sustain those contradictions within, um, within people, um, within US society, within US social thought. And I guess my, my second question has to do with kind of the moment that we're living in now, since the book does um, kind of offer us tools to think with. It's such a strange time, I'm sure, to be publishing a book that was researched over many years um, and that's coming out at a moment of, of extraordinary crisis at a time also of extraordinary possibility when the world is changing so rapidly. It's interesting to me that the book um, quotes um, the sociologist Sarah Babb writing several years ago that, quote, we live in a world that has mostly come to accept market capitalism as the only viable solution. But the book notes that that consensus can really be overstated. We live in a moment when ideas about socialism are very rapidly changing. The book invokes alter globalization proposals that flourished in the late 90s and, and survived to this day. And indeed, this is a moment that where I feel that um, some of those ideas actually about alternative globalizations that were being articulated in the late 90s are kind of being revisited for the first time in a, in a really significant way today. I mean, when was the last time everybody I knew was talking about the TRIPS agreement? You know, it was 1999. <laughs> um, and so I, I wonder sort of what your sense is right now about um, the sort of the possibilities of, of the current moment. Um, with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to the next commentator and, and look forward to, to your thoughts. Thanks so much for this great book. Thank you, Amy. Joanne, did you want to respond to that? Um, you, for, well, first, thank you, Amy, for summarizing my book uh, better than I can. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, but I think that I will gather up some questions and then maybe give some comments at the end. Okay. Very good. All right. Up next is Natasha Stevanovich Fenn, who is a senior research officer at the Institute for Reproductive Health, the IRH, at Georgetown University. And she has over a decade of experience in gender and international development working in the Balkans, the Middle East, and North Africa, South Asia, and Sub Saharan Africa. At IRH, she provides technical leadership and oversight of the conceptualization and operationalization of projects focused on the social determinants of adolescent sexual and reproductive health. And specifically, she's interested in how gender and social norms interact to shape adolescent sexual and reproductive behavior in the context of behavioral change programming. Her areas of technical expertise include applying a gender and social norms lens uh, to such things as child marriage and early uh, and, and adolescent pregnancy, uh, female and genital mutilations, male engagement and masculinities, couple counseling, and migration development nexus. Natasha, the Zoom screen is yours. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for this introduction and, and especially for having invited me here to be part of this uh, brilliant uh, panel. I, I admit I'm a little intimidated because as Sonia knows, um, I'm not a historian. And in fact, I have spent most of my career on the periphery of academia, so I'm not as widely published as, as, as you hear. Um, and I've been doing applied research uh, in the context of international development. So I'll, 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 I will not be bringing here a historical perspective. Um, 
that will definitely do my best uh, to be on par with this high level panel. Um, so I'm, I, I'd like to begin first by thanking Joan uh, for writing such um, a meaningful book uh, on the history of development aid from a US standpoint, because as someone who has been working in this field um, on several USAID funded projects and you know, with many of the NGOs that, um, that you mentioned in the book, I have to say that I've learned quite a lot um, about the evolution of uh, USAID's role, but uh, also it, you know, it's somewhat uncomfortable relationship with politics. Uh, but beyond that, what I also appreciated in the book is the mention of Bangladesh, which is a country that I have deep connections with because I, I not only did my, my dissertation on, on Bangladesh and remittances and development, but also I, uh, I started my international development career in this very country working for a local NGO uh, whose name I won't reveal here, but it's a kind of a sister NGO to the Grameen Bank uh, that also used a microcredit uh, model. So that, that, that book couldn't speak uh, more to me. Now, I thought that um, I'd, I'd share, I'd, I'm going to be much less theoretical here and be much more applied in, 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 in by sharing an anecdote based on my experience while working in Bangladesh uh, in that local NGO um, to show the other side of the story. And <clears throat> that is really, you know, the, the fight on global poverty and how it affects uh, people on the ground. You know, that is those very people whose development programs are supposed to benefit. So um, this was back in 1999 when microcredit programs um, had become the panacea, you know, for fighting global poverty, as you show very, uh, very well in the book. And in that local NGO, I was tasked to um, assess a women's empowerment um, program that consisted of training rural women as paradigal workers um, on their rights um, and entitlements under uh, Muslim customary law. And in turn, uh, with this knowledge in hand, it was assumed that these very women or these future paralegal teachers would be able to provide legal support to their fellow uh, community members and especially women, <clears throat> excuse me, who had suffered um, acts of uh, gender-based violence. And at the time we, we, we used to refer to it as human rights violation. Um, and those um, acts of gender-based violence usually typically included child marriage, rape, intimate partner violence, uh, and in some cases, um, acid throw. Uh, now, these women would have to take um, classes, and if my memory, because that was like almost 30 years ago, if my memory is right, is it was about 25 classes. So they had to teach these classes to their fellow members, which also meant that they would have to travel to different villages at their own cost, and again, on their own on their own time. And, and for anyone who has been in, in rural areas in Bangladesh, you know, the roads are, are very difficult to travel on. Um, but all of this in addition to being involved in their own domestic work. Um, so now one of the incentives to take part in such programs was the provision of small loans. Um, now, fast forward, I spent several months collecting data with many of these future legal aid workers and other uh, program participants. And to summarize the findings, simply at set the program and no, no surprise here, it didn't change much. And if anything, it had complicated these women's lives. So, you know, for sure it had increased their knowledge about their rights and how to seek legal help. Um, but then most of them would tell me, then what, what do we do with this? Um, you know, most of them, you know, would, would talk about how, you know, the restrictive values and the norms around women's mobility and public participation and access to public services and, you know, and how all of these obstacles prevented them from taking any kind of legal action. And in fact, in some cases, uh, it was condemned by the local authorities um, should a woman dare, you know, doing so. So, but the other complicated factor was that these women didn't have time to devote to either teaching or taking classes on top of all the reproductive and productive work that they had to do at home and outside the home, which you can ima imagine also in rural, you know, uh, in rural Bangladesh can be extremely time consuming without, you know, say, uh, a proper access to affordable clean energy. So, you know, they said... They would say it was just so much work to do it all. And especially because some of them worked in their farm, like rearing poultry. Um, and, you know, others were, you know, involved in other agricultural work. So this was very stressful. And in addition to also 
having the pressure of of managing loans, you know, without the you know the, the adequate skills and access to financial financial services, uh, but they still had to manage them to take loans to repay on time, etc. And I'm not even going to uh, go into the the various conflicts um, uh, that are well described in the book that uh, would happen um, at home um, with uh, with the husband. So beyond the gender perspective, what I'm trying to show with with this example is is a mismatch that you know, we as practitioners are often confronted to in development aid. And, and it's a mismatch between the expectations of development programs and their approaches um, and the realities of the context uh, within which these are implemented. Now, coming back to the fi microfinance approach, you know, the idea that um, by giving women access to credit, they would be empowered was as we've seen a bit, you know, naive because the approach did not address, the, you know, the structural conditions that place, um, you know, people and especially women in cycles of poverty. Um, you know, targeting women to improve their um, uh, economic situation is, uh, you know, is a nice idea. But you know, if one doesn't account for the, the the power dynamics and the hierarchies within the households and and other sociocultural factors that uphold beliefs and norms around women's reproductive and productive roles, then it really won't do much in terms of um, in terms of achieving greater equality. And, and this is doing my perspective to two assumptions that I'd like to highlight here. Uh, the first, um, and which, um, uh, you, you know, you don't go, you know, in detail in the book, because, you know, we, we know that we can't do it all in a book. But um, is that microcredit was based on the stereotypical gender assumption that women are only engaged in care work or unpaid labor. So therefore they have quote time unquote to engage in, in these programs. And, you know, so the idea was like, let's target them because on top of that, they will be, you know, great investors because um, they also, you know, care about their children and the well-being of the family. Um, but like the prominent feminist economist Naila Kabir, uh, and it, who is, by the way, also Bangladeshi, and I, she is worth noting here because she was a, a big, um, a big uh, leader uh, in the feminist economist movement, uh, particularly around uh, empowerment, and as 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 really sort of pioneered that work. Uh, but as as Kabir showed, microcredit did really nothing to challenge the structural causes of gender inequality, and it has also greatly overlooked you know, that aspect of women's labor and uh, women's lack of control over their own lives. And in fact, for her, it, you know, microcredit only reinforced inequality and, and poverty. Um, but another false assumption that I'd like to highlight and, and which the paralegal example reminds us is that while women are involved in unpaid work, many of them are also engaged in unpay, unpaid productive work contributing to food consumption, you know, like farming, like collecting food. And, and uh, while in other contexts, you know, they may be involved in paid productive, you know, labor, like selling fruits or nuts or vegetables and so on. So now uh, moving away a little bit from the, the microfinance, there's another point that I, I want to highlight specifically for the case of Bangladesh. Um, that are, and that is also relevant for the book and, 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 um, and for, yeah, I mean, you know, fight, the, the fight against global poverty um, is that around the same time that microcredit became popular, so did other um, um, two other major contributors to uh, Bangladesh's um, economic growth. One were remittances through massive temporary migration to the UAE, uh, leaving behind women and families to do both reproductive and paid productive labor in the absence of their husbands. And the other one was the ready-made garment industry, which contributed to what we call today the feminization of, of, um, of labor as women uh, started entering the, uh, the labor force en masse in the, in the mid 80s. So, uh, and that also contributed to a large flow of rural to urban female migrants. So um, I, I was wondering, and maybe that's, that's you know, a question uh, for Joan here, but why that, that doesn't um, appear um, in the book, or maybe it was in uh, one of the, the footnotes and I, and I, and I missed that. Um, but I will, um, I have other, you know, points that I'd like to make, but I'll leave it for our more general discussion, but to conclude, um, I'd say, and, and we know that there's no one, ma you know, magic bullet, you know, for fighting global poverty. I mean, it, it, as someone who's been working, you know, on the ground and, and doing this work for a while, I mean, we see it's a constant trial and error process. I mean, microcredits, you know, they were criticized heavily, but, you know, that, you know, they also were beneficial in some cases. And, 
But again, it's this constant trial and error process that shapes and and will continue to shape the debate over what are the best mechanisms to reduce poverty, right? Because in the end, we all know that fighting global poverty has, you know, is is also about you know maintaining influence and control, uh, um, and it, it's it's tied to foreign policy. But but what is const- constantly changing is is really the mechanisms. What are the best mechanisms to reduce poverty? And you know, we saw it started as the book showed showed brilliantly with trickle down economics, which did you know, which didn't work too well. Then it was a focus on women and empowerment, but that also had its challenges. Then it focused on on gender, but then you know, programs were you know then criticized for being limited to either a gender neutral or a gender aware approach, meaning that they didn't do much in terms of transforming norms and behaviors that uphold you know and continue to reinforce uh, gender inequality, and. And so then, and today, uh, uh, for those who, who are um, really familiar with international uh, development, it's it's shifted to what we now call gender transformative programs. You know, or also you know behavior change or social norms programming, all of which also promote male engagement because we realize that men have been set aside in our fight for gender equality, and that instead, you know, they could be engaged in a meaningful way as partners and also as agents of change, which Promundo. Um, um, is doing amazing work on that. So these gender transformative approaches are now key in development programs because they have the potential to um, to have more of a you know a sustainable impact in reducing poverty in the long term. Um, but you know, ten years from now, who knows? We'll realize that it's going to be something else, and that in the end, it didn't work so well. So. In other words, the, this mis- the mismatch of expectations and and the realities that I described earlier is is also what contributes to shifting global agendas and goals and you know and it's what also forces us to you know to rethink um, our our program designs and, and our approaches. So so it's not all a lost cause. And now to to close out, I'm going to ask two uh, questions to to Joan, and the first is. Um, I, w- I was just curious, it's, it's a simple question, but why you chose to focus solely on microcredit um, as one solution to reduce global poverty um, when, you know, we know that there are other competing forces. So you, you spoke a little bit about it earlier, but I, I'd love to hear a little more about even your personal experience with, with international development. And the second is, is oof, I'm sorry, not a simple one, but it relates to your last points in the book when... Um, you talk about just redistribution and, and you know, I, I was wondering how you, how do you see this as working on the ground and, or, you know, how should it be promoted, you know, as the solution for uh, reducing poverty? I'm going to stop here and wanted to thank you again. And I'm very honored to be part of this panel. Joanne, did you want to respond to anything just yet, or do you still want to hold on? I, I, I'll, I'll jump in now while, while we're seeing if Sonia can, can get that microphone working. Thank you. Um, so, so thank you. Thank you to both of you so much for those, for those really um, uh, wonderful comments. Um, so let me um, start off with uh, that contradiction between um, the welfare queen and the virtuous woman overseas which really was something that was so noticeable and interesting to me and not something that I can entirely explain. Although, as Amy said, some of it does have to do with its different people sort of um, uh, 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 promulgating those stereotypes so that the virtuous woman overseas was somebody who was mostly promoted by liberal and leftist economic development experts. And the welfare queen was of course, most notoriously promoted by, um, uh, by conservatives and most notoriously by Ronald Reagan in the, in, in the, in the era we're looking at. So it's somewhat different groups. Um, and I think that the, but both groups, both liberals and conservatives were highly concerned with dependency in the 1970s. It was um, such a negative word, um, such a negative buzzword. Uh, now, I think some of us see care work and dependence as something that's just uh, part of life. But back then, interdependence was good, but dependency was seen as quite a negative thing. And because welfare was understood as a government payout, it was understood as dependent, 
whereas women who were overseas engaging in microcredit were not seen as dependent and therefore that negative dependency stereotype didn't stick to them. But I also have to say that some of it has to do with homegrown American racism that that, um, you know, that that women, women of color, especially black women in the United States, especially black women who are on welfare, were stigmatized, stigmatized, and that that stigma could be um, kind of evaporate if you're looking at somebody who's in Bangladesh or who's far away. And so the. it's um, it, it's an it's an important distinction to make that um, that that homegrown racism could dissipate in a sense if somebody was farther away and could be seen perhaps as somebody else's problem um, and and but 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 the dependency issue is there too. Those are a couple thoughts on that. But I also want to say that. Um, both the hardworking microcredit entrepreneur overseas and the um, stigmatized uh, welfare uh, women at home, um, both of them were in some sense being treated similarly in that if you think of welfare reform in the 1990s, the idea was to put women to work. And so in both cases, it's about making sure that women who mostly mothers are also earning income and being fiscally disciplined and being, uh, you know, good financial subjects. Um, and so there's something kind of similar going on, a kind of um, austerity required of women and fiscal discipline required of women and income earning required of women that you see both domestically and abroad. So um, Natasha, um, thank you so much for um, what you said. I, I so um, have learned so much from talking to practitioners um, and, and have heard again and again about these contradictions between expectations and realities and about programs that sound good, but you know, don't quite pan out the way one, ex- one would hope uh, when, when they're actually put into practice. And so I really appreciate um, your sharing some of your own experience there. And I've certainly appreciated talking to people, um, uh, to practitioners throughout doing my research. Um, I, some of the things that you're mentioning are really important, like the attention to gender-based violence. It, that kind of takes off after when I stop my research. It's more a kind of 1990s and after thing. Um, and, and same with, I think the garment industry is really taking off a little bit later in, in places like Bangladesh, although certainly there's garment industries all over the world before that. Um, one of the things that I was interested in doing was showing how women as economic actors came into development programs in the 70s, and then what happened to that in the 1980s. And that's what led me specifically to microcredit some of the things like the development of the garment industry are about private investment and don't have that much to do with what we think of as the kind of economic development programs instituted by um, by government agencies or by NGOs and so on. So that was a kind of different realm from what I was looking at. And I was particularly kind to tra- track out what happened to the women in development movement that specifically focused on economic activity, on income generation. And that's how I ended up focusing more on microcredit. But certainly things, when we're thinking in terms of um, what happens to global poverty, things like uh, industrial development, remittances, even gender-based violence, uh, structured uh, structural inequalities, those are all deeply important and have become more so become have become come to the attention of development experts, I think, in a different way than they did in the period I was looking at. So, um, uh, you know, and and to the question of, um, you know, um, the possibilities now, which Amy brought up, and my notion of just redistribution that Natasha brought up, you know, um, I don't have very specific policy prescriptions. I do have things that seemed hopeful then, like I mentioned before, and that I would hope we would continue to think about now. Um, I think Amy's right that we're at a moment when we might start thinking about when we might, some of these issues might um, 
come to the fore again in ways they did in the 1970s, and I certainly hope that's the case. Um, you know, it was um, all of our good luck that Trump was voted out of office and Biden came in, and we might even imagine that that something that the U.S. might share, for example, vaccines with the rest of the world. Um, but there are lots of other aspirations that we can think about, including sort of major transfer of resources, uh, including international taxes and basic income for, throughout the world. There are lots of things that we can be thinking about that um, that maybe we couldn't think about or that weren't thought about for a number of decades that I hope that we can, um, people have been all along thinking about them for sure, but hopefully some of them may actually have more traction in the day we're in now. So let me just stop there so that, because I see Sonia is back on and, and I hope we can hear you, Sonia. It's now my pleasure to introduce our first discussant, Sonia Michelle is Professor Emerita of History, American Studies, and Women and Gender Studies at the University of Maryland College Park. With a PhD from Brown, she was a founding editor of the journal Social Politics, International Studies in Gender, State, and Society, and she has written widely on women, gender, and social policy. Among her books are Children's Interests, Mother's Rights, The Shaping of America's Child Care Policy, and her co-edited Reassembling Motherhood, Procreation, Care in a Globalized World. I should add that since retirement, Sonia has become an artist and is currently a member of the Touchstone Gallery in Washington, DC. And she's continuing to address issues of gender and social policy through her journalism. Sonia, the Zoom screen is yours. Well, I'm trying to make this very brief because I'm really sorry to have missed uh, Amy's remarks and most of Natasha's, although she and I talked a little before, so I have some idea. First of all, I want to say, and maybe this repeats something that other people have said, First of all, I want to say, uh, congratulate you, Joanne, on this wonderful book, and to say that it's not only a major contribution to world history, because you're bringing gender into a field where gender has not played a huge role this far, thus far, and you're also bringing world history into women's history. And I think that's giving us a whole different perspective. And hearing what Natasha was saying in, in response to your, you know, in, in response to your book, makes me realize that maybe we need more co-authored books, because in order to bring the kind of perspective that she has on the ground with the kind of work that I, the huge amount of work that I know you did in the archives uh, really takes, it's the work of more than one person. So maybe it's time to abandon solo authored, uh, you know, to, to move on from solo authored books because it's just, <clears throat> but I, but having, getting the whole picture is really very exciting. Um, my first question was originally, and maybe you've already answered it and you, you, you did answer it a little bit in just what I just heard is how you got from books like Women Adrift and even How Sex Changed to this one. I mean, you sort of told us a little bit about your intellectual path and the Percy Amendment and all that. But so it's a little bit about the archival path, but, but it's just such a very different kind of book. So I just wonder what challenges it presented you as a historian and intellectually and methodologically and what insights, if any, you brought from your earlier work to this one. Or, uh, you know, were there any, and, and if so, what were they, and how did they, um, and how did they, um, how did they help you write this, this particular book? Um, the, my second question was, was wanting to know what the impact of the programs was on the ground, and I think that your, that Natasha's comments and your response to her helped answer that question. So I will, um, I'll bag that one for the moment. Um, and you were also talking about the comparison between the welfare queens at home and the and the uh, virtuous producers abroad. Um, but I just wonder, I just had a specific question and maybe you answered it. I, I noticed it wasn't just that that turning women into producers resonated with with uh, Reagan's dis growing disenchantment with welfare, but also the, the Clintons really glommed onto it, too, especially Hillary. And I wonder, you, you talked about their interest in microcredit. I wonder if you came across any evidence that their interest in an, an experience with uh, a pro promotion of microcredit also fed into Clinton's promote uh, support for TANF. I mean, was there, in other words, there reciprocity? Did that go in, in both directions? Maybe you already talked about this. I don't know, but I'd really be interested to know that. And then finally, to pick up on some of the comments you just were making at the very end, it's clear that global poverty is an intransigent pro problem, but it seems to me that one of the assumptions you make in the book is that 
um, much of the poverty in the nations of the global south is the result of the fact that the global north has long been extracting value from those countries. And maybe Amy talked about this too. And it's clear with some countries like the petro, you know, the, the petroleum producing countries that that's true. But I wonder in, if in other countries, especially in Africa, but maybe also in Latin America, other than oil and maybe other natural resources, what exactly were we extracting from these countries? And can we really blame the global north for extracting wealth from these countries? And if so, what was it? Okay, I mean, bracketing slavery, which is, of course, a huge, I mean, and, and all the, the labor power that came from that. But in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, what, what if any value are we continuing to extract from those countries? And then that leads to the, um, my last question, which, which picks up on your last comment about, you know, whether or not some kind of worldwide redistribution can really help you know, some kind of international tax or something. I mean, all of the inherent pro problems that you talked about, that Natasha talked about, and maybe Amy talked about, the structural problems, the patriarchy, the, you know, uh, I mean, do we want to see a Chinese model for every country? Is that really, you know, this kind of state-run enterprise? Is that really the solution? Is that something we would like to see replicated? Or how, you know, how, how do you see, how do you actually see, or have you talked to people who've talked about how they see uh, some kind of global redistribution of capital? How would that actually work on the ground and how would it address uh, some of the inherent problems that, that we know are there? So that's, those are some questions, quick questions. Um, so, so thank you, Sonia, for that and for, the, for the, those good questions. And um, let me try to answer some of them quickly so that we have some time for um, audience questions as well. Um, so, yeah, the, the first question, what challenges did this pose for me? This was a very different kind of book for me than what I had written before, but it also was similar in the sense that I was thinking about questions of gender and how understandings of gender have changed. Um, and I was thinking, as I had in earlier and some earlier works about biopolitics, about how po populations are managed and how we might think of the management of populations. Uh, but it did um, require for me um, a retooling of sorts, a, a reading a lot in a new era and a new area and a new field. And that was one of the joys of it, actually. You know, there are historians who write the same, you know, write volume two of volume one and volume three of volume one and two. And that's not where my interest lies. I like new challenges and I learned a lot in, in doing this. And there's still a lot more for me to learn. Um, Clinton. So yeah, so the Clintons were very much into microcredit. Um, they actually, and Lily Geismer has written about this in a Journal of American History article, that they, um, they started a microcredit program in Arkansas uh, based on Eunice's program in Bangladesh. They were friends with Eunice, they brought him over to Arkansas, uh, and they started such a program with funding from Walmart and all sorts of other places. So they were taken with this, um, Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton both, um, and I didn't find any evidence that it directly fed into the welfare reform, it, although I wasn't doing that kind of research of looking into what the Clintons were up to in the 90s, so someone else may well find it. But I think the ideas behind it are quite similar, as I was saying in answer to Amy's question, this notion that uh, women should be income generators, uh, that poor women should be income generators in that sense. So I think that, the, you know, that women on welfare shouldn't be dependents, that they should be uh, engaged in, in, in work for pay. So, um, so I think there is something there. I didn't, I didn't look for or find those direct connections. Um, so there are lots of things that have been extracted from the global south other than oil, um, you know, copper, bauxite, uh, coffee, sugar, uh, the list could go on and on. Um, and so, so I think, you know, but it's true that not every nation has been um, exploited in the same sense by the global north, and it doesn't explain all of global poverty. And, and, and I I don't think I said that. I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. So I think there are all sorts of reasons for for poverty in various places, including within the United States. Uh, some of them have to do with various kinds of exploitation. Some of them may have to do with other things. But um, there, uh, the, the goal of ending this kind of material deprivation 
is a good goal, I think, whatever the causes. So, um, and back to the question, do I think we should all be like China? No, um, but do I think that we need to bring the state back in? Yes. And so I do think that um, the sort of anti-statist neoliberalism went, uh, uh, you know, eliminated all sorts of state kinds of programs that uh, should be there. That of course doesn't mean that there shouldn't be, uh, people shouldn't fight against corruption in government or that all governments are good or that everything the state does is good. But it does seem to me that um, providing for social, providing social provision is one function of the state that should not be diminished. Uh, that things like education and healthcare uh, and, and basic food and you know, basic income, these kinds of things are things that should be state functions. They should be done well. Um, I, you know, you think of something like in the United States, something like uh, Medicaid, um, is there fraud? Yes, there's a lot of fraud. Should we eliminate Medicaid? No, we shouldn't. We should eliminate the fraud. And that's my view on, on the state. Should, we should provide state provisions. Are there problems with it? Yes, we should eliminate the problems, not the state provision. All right, thank you very much. Folks in the audience, raise hand function or the Q&A. I wanna start off if I could just get in a question of my own here. The book deals with the global North and amongst other things and reformers visions for tackling and ending global poverty. What role do the nations of the global South play in this process um, uh, in terms of their own internal structures, their own commitments to eradicating poverty, their own commitments or rather lack thereof to anything resembling uh, gender equity. Um, the book focuses on one side of an, uh, an equation. I'm wondering if you could just expand a little bit um, uh, about the countries that receive this aid and that the role that they play in either fostering the campaign against global poverty or at least poverty in their countries, uh, or um, entrenching that poverty? So um, I think one of the things I was trying to do in the book was to show that the field of development experts expands in the 1970s, so that many of these experts do come from the global south. They don't just come from the global north. So this is an international movement where some of the ideas that get taken up in the global north, in the US, are ones that are put forward by people from the global south. So I wasn't trying to sort of talk about one side and not the other side, as you put it. Um, so um, yeah, I, I, I guess that's sort of uh, my, my initial thought on your question. Um, I also talk in the book about the new international economic order in which it's not about development experts per se, but about leaders from the global South and their visions of what they imagine should happen, uh, both, to end, both to end inequities between the South and North and to uh, end poverty within their own countries. Some of the people who are involved in this um, program, in this sort of notion of recalibrating um, the relationships between North and South were also deeply involved in fighting poverty within their own nations. So I think of Julius Nyerere in Tanzania or Michael Manley in Jamaica, and that they were deeply involved in these basic needs programs uh, attempting to end poverty within their own nations. That's not the case in every nation of the global South. And one of the problems I would say, uh, you know, I was trying to look at this um, without focusing on a particular place or a particular program. And uh, out, aside from the sort of my, as a, me as a US historian looking at the US. And one of the things that we, uh, it ends up homogenizing in a sense. And I can't tell you about what went on in every nation or in every place. And that's sort of, a more fine-tuned work, I think, that other people can be doing and can be looking at. You know, so like if you want to look at what exactly happened in in Tanzania, other people have done that work, um, or what exactly happened in Jamaica, other people are working on that. But what I can say is that in the that in many of the nations of the global south um, were involved in both asking for a kind of transfer of resources and technology 
and, uh, and challenging the ways that uh, economic international trade benefited, automatically benefited the wealthier nations and were interested in ending poverty within their own nations and often saw those as, uh, as, as, as conjoined. Thank you. We have two questions that I'm gonna combine here. Uh, one from Robert Hare um, and the second from Andrew uh, uh, Konov. Um, and they go like this. If you could just define microcredit in dollar amounts, please. Um, and secondly, how does the communitarian nature of microcredit play into the story? Most popular version of microcredit involves loans that are guaranteed communally by a group of women. Did proponents see a contradiction between promoting microcredit as a means of individual empowerment and its communal structure? So kind of reflect on kind of the mechanics uh, of, of the microcredit phenomenon. Okay, so the dollar amount is very difficult um, to find, um, but what I think, the closest I could come was a 2015 figure from the World Bank that said that microcredit in that year was a sort of 60 to $100 billion industry, something like that. Um, so that's the best I can do. You know, there's so many, there are hundreds, probably thousands of small microcredit programs all over the world. And there's not exactly a registry of this where we can add them all up and say, what is the dollar amount? Um, so the mechanics of this, it's really different and it changes over time. So it started out um, as a kind of nonprofit um, uh, uh, venture and it had some different, it had a number of variations. The Grameen Bank was this sort of small group communal uh, borrowing uh, where, where groups would borrow, but individuals would repay, would get funds and repay, but they would meet in groups and uh, there would be some social pressure from other members of the group to repay. Um, but it was originally understood as something that was not for profit, but that could be sustainable uh, because um, the, the, the loans were repaid with interest and that that interest could then be used um, to, to pay for whatever administrative costs there were in, in running this. So that was a model. Um, what happened in, um, and I, I talk about this in the book, in the, in the 21st century is that for-profit groups start coming into this and start making a lot of money um, selling, start making a lot of money with businesses, with microcredit businesses. And um, that leads to various forms of exploitation so that microcredit isn't particularly sounding all that much better than what the local money lender uh, used to do. And uh, bunches of people come in and start, you know, even having um, public offerings of microcredit businesses so that people are wealthy people are making money off of off of microcredit, off of, off of poor people, which is, you know, not what the original intention certainly was. And so it has changed um, and the for-profit um, has been widely condemned. Mohammed Yunus certainly condemns the for-profit microcredit businesses. Um, and, and, it is, and it helped sort of turn the tide against microcredit in the literature, which was at first skeptical. Some of the critics were skeptical. Uh, some of the more of the critics and then the sort of just this wave of criticism as the for profit microcredit industry grew. And so it has changed over time and has become uh, much more what you might just think of as a, a business of money lending. Thank you. We have a question from Vidar Jorgensen that touches upon, I think, something that you deal with at the very last portion or the last pages of the book. And the question is, goes like this. According to the World Bank, China opened up and deregulated its economy starting in 1978, and the poverty rate has gone down from higher than 90% to well under 10% in 2019. In China alone, more than 800 million people have been lifted out of poverty. And similar steps in other Asian tiger, quote unquote, countries produced comparable reductions in poverty. Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea, Singapore, and Thailand. This period from the 70s to 2020 has produced the most dramatic reduction in global poverty in human history. And the question, how can these dramatic reductions in poverty be explained in the context of the themes of this webinar and presumably the book today? 
So, so yes, there has been um, dramatic reduction in poverty in certain nations. And um, I think that comes back uh, in most cases to what I was talking about in terms of the, the responsibility of the state, because the places where poverty has been most reduced, it's been state led. Um, and so in contrast to the sort of neoliberal vision of market led um, uh, reduction of poverty, which doesn't seem to have taken place. It's in the places where the state has taken action, the poverty has been most reduced. And so yes, there has been a dramatic decline in poverty, but not everywhere. And certainly if you look at say Sub-Saharan Africa, the statistics are really quite different and the situation is, is still quite serious in terms of you know, extensive uh, poverty. And with the current pandemic, there have been all sorts of, um, uh, I guess, uh, all sorts of statements from the United Nations and the World Bank and various other people saying that poverty, you know, the expectation is that billions of people are going to sink back into poverty because of the sort of declining economy around the pandemic. And so it just reminds us how precarious the progress has been and how easily it, it can be it can be reversed. Juan Pablo Cervantes asked a question that's right uh, germane to what you just said uh, about the pandemic placing millions uh, uh, in back into poverty. Um, what's the path forward? Um, how can this be addressed? Uh, and I assume, you know, are the lessons of this book um, positive and negative ones that could guide recovery? You know, again, I'm so, you know, I'm the classic historian who like doesn't want to sort of prescribe policy and say what exactly can be done. And I think there are people who are probably much better at doing that than I am. But again, I like us to remember some of the bolder ideas, some of the ideas that involve the sharing of resources from the wealthier nations to the poorer nations, the sharing of re the redistribution of resources within nations. It seems to me that the kinds of programs that don't involve redistribution are, um, are, 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 are kind of tepid and don't actually um, address the issues and the ways that more redistributive programs do. I think, you know, say within the United States, we have a taxation system that is at least to some extent redistributive, a progressive taxation system, and that's a good thing. And I think we need more uh, kinds of policies that acknowledge the need for redistribution. Thank you. Diego Hurtado Torres asks, could you expand more uh, about the role played by American universities in the fight against poverty in the global South? Hmm. That's an interesting question. There are all sorts of, um, there are all sorts of um, development programs um, and women in development programs that took place within universities and um, even uh, organizations and foundations like the Ford Foundation um, funded a number of such programs. And so there have been a lot of the economists, the development economists who have been involved in this field have often been scholars, have often been working in universities and have gotten funding from USAID, from the Ford Foundation, from various other places. Um, some of the, um, they differ in their politics, um, depending on where you are. I think of a group like the uh, Institute for Development Studies at the University of Sussex, which has been a more progressive force in terms of, um, uh, of the development economists, the sort of um, unorthodox types of development econ uh, economics that it promotes. And so it's a, it's a, there's a vast field out there and universities have definitely been involved. Thank you. Uh, Natasha, I see your hand up. You want to jump yeah, in here? Yeah, I just wanted to address this question because I can speak, you know, again, you know, from my experience that working at the Institute for Reproductive Health, which now is nested in the, um, the, the, the Center for Child and Human Development at Georgetown University. And, um, you know, most of our work at IRH has been, um, uh, you know, we're a university, we're a center, and we have, um, we, most of our work has been, you know, to, really on, on fighting against, you know, poverty and, and particularly reproductive health um, in the global south. So, but I, what I wanted to add was that there's really a, a, um, a push now uh, by donors and donors like USAID too and, and or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to partner with local universities. So for example, 
um, most of my projects right now um, are part in in uh, the DR in the Democratic Republic of Congo um, are partnering with uh, the Kinshasa School of Public Health, for example, um, and to um, um, you know for them to actually do the research and particularly during the pandemic. I mean that has really shifted. Um, this unequal power dynamic between HQ and and you know the and and those who are really implementing those programs and it has also shifted the leadership and the ownership over those those projects. So um, just wanted to to highlight that um, there's definitely that push now to to partner more with um, local universities as well. Thank you. Thank you. And that's something that I see too at the end of the period that I'm looking at that uh, the the push to partner not only with local universities but with local NGOs. We have a question from Durba Mitra, who thanks you uh, for this immensely generative talk and your precise responses to these commentaries. Uh, and I wonder if you might reflect on the relationship between the rise of U.S. aid for global microcredit programs and the global women's movements. Were there feminists from the global south who were visible in the making of the frameworks of microcredit? So yes, Durba, there were, and, and I'm hoping you're going to write about that in your in, in the book you're working on now. Um, so um, some of the early advocates of microcredit were feminists and were feminists from the global south. Certainly, Elabot and the Self-Employed Women's Association was probably the best known of 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 in, from India, uh, the best known such woman who whose. Uh, her Gandhian trade union, the Self-Employed Women's Association, was involved early on in, in microcredit programs. And she was a big supporter, but it wasn't a minimalist program. It was a program that also included cooperatives and childcare and uh, protections against police harassment of street vendors and so on. And so yet yeah, early on, uh, and, and, and the group Dawn, um, that uh, a group from the global group, global feminist from the global, excuse me, set feminists from the global south who formed a group in the 1980s, Dawn. They were also in favor of early on of microcredit, although they focused more on microcredit from the state than from the private side of it. And so there were lots of feminists uh, from the global south who were definitely involved in this. Uh, it, the, it becomes the case that Muhammad Yunus is the one who gains the most traction uh, and his very precise and minimalist program is the one that gets the most attention, partly because it's so large, partly because it's minimalist and you can just focus right in only on microcredit, and partly because he was just, he is such, he still is such a brilliant ambassador of what he was doing. Thank you. Sonia, you had a question? Yeah, I, I had a, a point and a question. One is, uh, uh, Joanne, I wonder if you would consider the market as a form of redistribution. Um, the market as a form of redistribution, that is rather than, you know, some kind of progressive international taxation system. I mean, in a sense, if you look at what's going on with China, the, U the relationship between the U.S., not just the U.S., but probably Europe as well, um, and China now, I mean, basically what we're doing is they're producing and we're buying. So we are redistributing. I mean, we're, we're redistributing. We're sending huge amounts of capital to China every minute for various products that we're importing from them. So that's just, I wonder if, you know, how you would compare that to your, your vision of redistrib redistribution. And the point, but the point I want to make, and this goes back to something that Tasha mentioned about remittances, is that one of the ironies of the contemporary labor system is that we are and we're not we're not just uh, hosting ma male migrant workers. We're hosting a lot of female migrant workers now in the U.S. and in Europe as caregivers, as care workers, and they're sending re you know huge amounts of remittances back to their families. And the irony is that while a lot of international programs are trying to improve the health and the education and so forth of children in the global South by removing mothers, by removing women. We're removing the people who are very most likely to make sure that the kids go to the clinic, go to schools, get fed, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, you know, we're extracting, I mean, this is another form of extraction. We're extracting that kind of caring labor from the global south at this point and arrogating it to ourselves in the global north and, um, uh, and, and probably exacerbating 
the pro one of the problems there, which is you know the problem you alluded to, the issue of the of state providing states providing education and health care. Um, so I, I do think that remittances are a form of redistribution, um, although they're a form of redistribution off of the backs of people who are are themselves relatively poor. And so um, it's, it is a form of redistribution and it's a really important one. It's a lot of money that's, that's being remitted. Um, I do think that the market redistributes. It doesn't always redistribute in, in, in a way that goes from the, the wealthy to the poor. And that's where I think you need a more intentional kind of redistribution. The growth of inequality is, is, is just as is frightening, the sort of extent of inequality we have, say, within the United States. And that's based on a redistribution. Um, and it's a redistribution toward the wealthy and it's market based. So I think we have to be, yes, the market redistributes, but how it redistributes and where it redistributes um, is it, isn't uh, that easy to direct. But you would have to agree that the mark, the redistribution, I mean, it is the market that has, has reduced poverty in a place like China, right? I mean, that is the market. Um, I mean, I, I, mean, I agree it's, a, it's a not a completely equal, but it has had that effect. Um, I think it's state-led marketization so that it's the state's involvement that if it was just purely the market that we would not be seeing the reduction in poverty that we see in China, that it has to do with state-led programs that help reduce poverty. So I think that yes, it involves the market, but I don't think that can happen in the absence of the state. A final question here from Krista Lindenmeyer. Did the U.S. Congress ever fund microcredit as foreign aid? Hi, Christy. Um, so yes, the U.S. government did uh, fund microcredit as foreign aid. Starting in 1987, uh, it started uh, putting millions of dollars. I think the first one was 50 million, and then the next year it doubled, and then it went up from there in the Clinton administration. So yes, the U.S. government has put money into microcredit overseas. All right, thank you very much. I'm afraid it's now 5.30 and I have to draw this to a close. Uh, there's a lot more in this book uh, and sessions like this can only scratch the surface uh, of, 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 in this case, uh, a very rich uh, and detailed uh, study. Uh, so I would recommend the book to you. Uh, my thanks uh, to Joanne, to Amy, Sonia, Natasha, uh, as well as those of you uh, in the audience. Please join us next week on Monday, May 24th at 4 p.m. when we return to discuss Louis Menon's recently published book, The Free World, Art and Thought in the Cold War, uh, with Kathy Pice and Judith Coffin. And with that, good night. Thank you, everyone, and take care.